And now, stay tuned for the program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Transcribed by the Signal Oil Company for Christmas Eve to enable the entire production staff of The Whistler to spend Christmas Eve at home with their family. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler brings you a most unusual story. One of the most heartwarming stories of our time. Especially appealing this Christmas Eve. Three Wise Guys. "'Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house, "'not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. "'Even Broadway, that glamorous avenue of make-believe "'in faraway New York, seemed empty, deserted. "'Most cafes and eating places were closed. "'But the doors of an occasional refuge "'for those hardy souls who prefer to walk alone were still open. "'Such a place was Good Time Charlie's Bar on 49th Street, "'where on another Christmas Eve... A series of unusual events began, ending in one of the most unusual stories Good Time Charlie had ever listened to. At the moment, Charlie is listening to the voice of a man named Al. As is well known to one and all, Charlie, I am not one to complain. But it strikes me that Broadway would bring very little tonight on the open market. I know you ten, maybe fifteen years, Al. Until now, I don't know you know there is an open market. <laughs> For the past twelve months that I know of, I am 100% legitimate. Honest, legitimate Al. Want another rock candy and rye? Without the rock candy? I, uh, very seldom indulge in alcoholic beverages. But in answer to your question, yes. Haven't seen you for a year, Al. Want to run over that part again where you tell me you're playing it straight for the past 12 months? As of last Christmas Eve, I am a 100% honest ticket scalper. I do not make a killing, but I get that good warm feeling that comes with being 100% legit. It feels good to play it straight. Cozy. You want to tell me about it, Al? I do not mind if I do, good time, Charlie. It all begins a year ago tonight, right here in your strictly high-class drum. Blondie Swanson was here with me, remember? Yeah, I think I do remember, Al. Now, Blondie Swanson is one of the gentry which operates on that side of the law as very few call right. Though Blondie himself always feels this is a matter of opinion. But Blondie is not concerned with his racket a year ago tonight. You are busy chauffeuring the bar, good time, Charlie, so maybe you do not notice the sad scene. Yep, it is last year, just about this same time, when Blondie comes in here. His big frame pretzled with grief. Hello, Al. Well, hiya, Blondie. I see you are not so happy tonight. Why not join me in a medicinal rock candy and rye? Uh, without the rock candy. I am fighting off a touch of grip. Okay, Al. I got a bad case of memories tonight. If I can pack away the grip, maybe it can take a load off my memory. Hey, Charlie, two more rock candies and rice uh, without the rock candy. I'll slide them down. Are these uh, conversational memories, Blondie, or shall we give them to Clint? You recall a doll named Clarabelle Cobb, Al? Miss Clarabelle Cobb? Of course I do. She is well known to one and all on Broadway as a leading light with George White Scandal some years back. Yeah. Well... Christmas Eve is an anniversary for me. It was on Christmas Eve that Clarabelle left me to marry an honest guy in Akron, Ohio. There you are. Oh, drink up, honey. <coughs> up to now, I remember Miss Clarabelle Cobb as a doll with Class A judgment. Why did she put distance between her and you? Well, Clarabelle was a gal that didn't care as much about how much money you had as she did where you got it. 
She felt that my role was ample but tainted. And this is why she puts on the exit? Right. I can see now that she was right, but now it's too late. But there must be other dolls as beautiful and desirable, and not such quiz masters as to where the scratch comes from. I'll never look at another da- ga- doll again, Al. They're there for other guys. Hey, Blondie! Her. Blondie Swanson! Well, if it ain't the Dutchman! Oh, look, Al! Uh, Al, Blondie, you tides all around. Oh, I cannot believe my eyes, Dutchman. I have not seen you in East parts for maybe a full calendar or so. I've been detained in the West. Oh, it's a sad story. And I can see that all you two guys need is one more sad story. But you're not going to hear none. I got good news for you. And you have come to the right place, Dutchman. I always get kind of down on Christmas Eve. What I'm going to tell you will give you a big lift. Blondie, you and me have pulled a few fast deals together. But I got one tonight that's the softest touch of all. Oh, you can listen, Al. We'll cut you in, too. <laughs> I have turned down soft touches before. But not wishing to be rude, I will hear you out. Well, some months back, three other guys and me knocked off a tin safe in a factory over in Pennsylvania. It was a cinch haul on account of we received a dead center tip. The tip was on the level. So we stash 50 G's in our grip sack and get set to hit the open road. Something detained you? The cops. After hot blasting from both sides, I find myself alone on the lam with 50 G's in the grip sack. But it's not a clean getaway, and I figure it's better to find a hiding place for the dough, not wanting to be caught with the goods. I am beginning to get the idea. You're suggesting that the three of us go for this dough tonight and cut it three ways. That's the idea. It's in an unpopulated barn under the floorboards. When I decide to go get it, the first guy I think of is you, Blondie. How about it? I must admit, I got no other plans, Dutchman. Nice of you to think of me. Count me in. How about you, Al? Uh, I am not generally known as a spoil sport, but uh, this prospect frankly holds no appeal for me. I do not wish to join the party. This is your final answer? Yes, Dutchman, you may quote me. I will not go with you. Charlie, that's the way it went. I am certain I will not leave your bistro that night. I am negative to the whole scheme, and I'm nixing it loud and clear to one and all. So imagine my surprise at some later point to find myself warm and cozy in the back seat of the Dutchman's ancient philosophy, dogging it through the snow-covered countryside. The whole setting is so peaceful, I am catching small doses of snooze. But in between times, I cannot help but overhear the upfront conversation of Blondie and the Dutchman. You sure this is the right road, Dutchman? Certainly, I'm sure. I can fly this road blind if necessary. You are not flying blind now, so you must have noticed that the radiator is percolating again. I think we better stop and take on another load of snow. I uh, guess we'll have to. But I sure hate these delays. Uh. Hey, Dutchman. Listen. Must be coming from that little church. Yeah, yeah. Come on, help put the snow in the radiator. Sounds real pretty, that kind of singing. You think that's pretty? Well, you hear real music. The kind money makes when it's crisp. Hey, hey, Blondie, Dutchman, where, where are we? In Pennsylvania, Al. Not far from that barn where I stashed the factory payroll. How can you tell? I, for one, see very little but darkness around and about. I got to agree with Al, Dutchman. I got a feeling we're lost. Maybe we better give the whole scheme up. Well, you two give up easy. I tell you, I know for certain we're close to that barn. I can tell by that big fat star I've been following for the last few miles. Oh, yeah. I am seeing a small light ahead. But I observe if this is a star, it is hanging very low to the ground. Uh, I still got a feeling we are lost. Why don't we go back to good time Charlie's, which is a lot easier to find. I don't care how low this star is hanging. I know it's leading me straight. I'm running this show, so you two better seal up. There, look. I'm right as rain. This is a barn. I do not wish to start an exchange of words. But that star you follow turns out to be nothing more than a light from the window of said barn. Ah, okay. So somebody's living in the barn. I'll take care of them if they're too hard to get along with. Uh, I vote for getting out of here. I am not dressed to call on strangers myself. Come on, and cut the gab. Besides, maybe there's only animals in the barn. 
I don't see no human footprints in the snow, except ours. Good. Oh, big dog gone. Look through that window, Blondie. Is that a doll in there? Well, let me see. Yeah. Yeah, she's a doll. Not only that, I don't think she's feeling in the pink either. Well, now that we are here, let us go inside and see if there's anything we can do for her. I don't care nothing about a sick doll. I want to lay my mitts on that grip sack with a 50 G's in it. Come on. Who, who's there? Uh, who, who are you? We mean no harm. We... We... Well, for... If it ain't Miss Clarabelle Cobb in person. Friends, to all of you who have opened your homes to the Whistler, not only throughout the year, but even tonight on Christmas Eve, the Signal Oil Company has asked me to express their sincere appreciation for this privilege and pleasure. And we of the cast want to add our thank you, too. During the eight consecutive years that the Whistler has been broadcast by Signal Oil Company, many of us have celebrated Christmas with many of you a number of times. And believe me, we're mighty proud that you consider us part of your entertainment family. Tonight, on behalf of Signal Oil Company and the independent signal dealers who serve you in the states of California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Nevada, Arizona, and Utah, I want to convey warmest season's greetings. May the many blessings of living in these United States of America enrich your holiday season and the new year. Yes, Al, that isolated barn in the snow-swept Pennsylvania countryside, so far removed from Good Time Charlie's Bar, where you're now enjoying Charlie's rock candy and rye without the rock candy, held a surprising development for you, Blondie Swanson, and the Dutchman, didn't it? The three of you had driven there that Christmas Eve a year ago to claim the $50,000 payroll the Dutchman had hidden there. The presence of Miss Clarabelle Cobb in the barn at your arrival was something not even her ex-boyfriend, Blondie Swanson, could fathom immediately. And you were even more puzzled than Blondie, weren't you, Al? Only the Dutchman seemed to have the faintest understanding of what it's all about. So, you turned to the Dutchman. Dutchman, I am not understanding all this. Why do you not inform us? Listen, Al, you and Blondie better clear out of here for a while. Take a walk in the snow. I guess I'll have to take care of this doll. Huh? Uh, look, Dutchman, I haven't seen Clarabelle for a long time. If you think I'm going to leave her now and go for a walk with her, you are nuts. Besides which, Dutchman, this doll is clearly at grips with some strange malady. I do not think it is polite the three of us should visit in this manner at this time. Listen, I came here to get 50 G's, not a sick doll, and a lot of lip from you two. This won't take long, so blow. But, Dutchman... I'm getting fed up with you, Blondie. I know what I'm doing. I've delivered seven of the eight kids my wife's had. And I never needed no doctor. This one will be a cinch. Now, will you get out of here? <sighs> I cannot help but say this is quite a night for surprises, Blondie. Yeah. I, for one, can take winter sports or leave them to someone else. Al. Uh, yeah, Blondie. We could take the Dutchman's car there. You think Clarabelle will be better off if we get her a doc? Well, I am new in this racket, Blondie. But if you want an inexperienced opinion, I will say... What was that? What? That! Well, Blondie, I am new in this racket. But if you want an inexperienced opinion, I will say... Miss Clarabelle Cobb is a cinch mother. Come on, let's get back to the barn. <laughs> Cry, Clarabelle. No sense crying. Oh, Blondie. I know if all of a sudden I found myself with a brand new kid, I wouldn't be crying. Special since it's such a such a 
beautiful kid. You, you really think he's beautiful, Blondie? Oh, I sure do. He, he's sleeping, huh? Uh-huh. Bless his heart. <laughs> if he only gets a break. Oh, don't worry about him, Clarabelle. A, a, a beautiful kid like that, they love him in Akron. Oh, Blondie, there's so much I want to tell you. Yeah, but maybe you ought to sleep now yourself, huh? Not till I tell you, Blondie. You've got to know about everything. Why I'm staying here in Dr. Kelton's barn. About Joe, my husband. He's in such trouble, Blondie. He's in jail. Come on, Al. Let's go find the clip sack. I know right where it is. Hey, look, Al. This is more like it. Yeah, it's all there. 50,000 bucks. A very likely sight. Oh, this is all that counts. A fat swatch of cash. Especially if it's mine. Come on, let's get Blondie and clean out of this barn. You ain't going anywhere with that dough, Dutchman. You want to play that again, Blondie? Same song. I said you ain't going anywhere with that dough. Hey, you tell me what he said, Al. I don't like what I'm hearing. Hmm. Blondie has mouthed the same identical words two times around, Dutchman. And I, for one, get the impression he means it. I do. You didn't tell us the whole story of this dough and how you came by it, Dutchman. Now, listen, Blondie. No, I've been listening. I heard everything you said about this factory payroll job you pulled, and you never did say anything about trusting up the bookkeeper at the factory that night. So what? Not only that, you make it look like it's the inside job and leave the bookkeeper to take the rap. So they got to nail somebody for it. Why are you building such a case for this cluck bookkeeper? This cluck bookkeeper, Joseph Hatcher, happens to be Clarabelle's husband. That's his kid you deliver, Dutchman. No kidding. No kidding. Did, did Miss Clarabelle Cobb tell you all this, Blondie? She told me plenty. This Joseph Hatcher's been cooling in the clink ever since. He was doing a special bookkeeping job for his factory. Came here from Akron to do it. He's a right guy, an honest guy. Or can you understand that, Dutchman? Here, Blondie, here's something honest I understand. Hey. Yeah, a gun. Easy, Dutchman. Shut up, Al. Now, look, Blondie, I've been patient with you. I know you're soft at this doll, and that's your business. But you're interfering with mine, Blondie, and I don't like that. Now, let's get out of here with the dough and quick. I said, come on, let's get going. Dutchman, please put the iron away. It is not in keeping with the season to pull a heater on, Blondie. In addition to which, the shouting is apt to wake that kid who is a pretty tired character like his mama. Well, now you're going soft, Al. What's with you two? Listen, Dutchman. Clarabelle's husband don't know she's living in this barn. When she heard they'd sorted him away on a bum rap, she came here to try to help him. And she found out she was going to have a kid, and she looked up a doc here, a guy named Kelton. Clarabelle's got no dough. But Doc Kelton gives her first-rate care all up to now. Even fixes it so she can stay in his barn. It is not great. But it beats living in a snowbank. Uh, stow it, will you? The heater, Dutchman. Hide it, huh? Mm. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. But I'm still running the show, wise guys. And this is what we do. Blondie, here's the grip sack. Take my crate out there and find this Doc Kelton character. Pay him off for what he's already done for the doll. Give him some more for taking care of her and a kid from here on in. Then bring the grip sack back here... And we'll blow. Yeah. Well, you bet, Dutchman. And you can tell this doctor a couple of things for me. Tell him to get Clarabelle and the kid to a hospital where they belong. Sure, Dutchman. Sure. And tell him that till now we didn't need no doc. That the Dutchman took care of things perfect. And that Mama and kid are doing nice. Real nice. of you who play Canasta or have been thinking of taking up the game, there's a little Christmas gift for you at your nearest signal service station. It's a 12-page booklet on that exciting new version of Canasta, Hollywood's three-deck Canasta, which is replacing the old two-deck game practically everywhere it's been tried. 
In fact, Robert Lee Johnson, the only Pacific Coast member of the National Canasta Laws Commission, says of this game, you'll never know how much fun cards can be until you've played this exciting new three-deck game. It has completely replaced two-deck canasta with all my friends in Hollywood. And friends, the booklet I mentioned is written by the man who devised this new game. So the rules are both complete and authentic. Right now, in fact, this booklet is being sold by leading department stores in 32 states. But you needn't buy a copy. One is waiting for you free while the supply lasts at any signal service station. It is the hope of your signal dealer that this fun-packed new version of Canasta will add to the card-playing pleasure of your holidays. It was almost midnight on Christmas Eve at Good Time Charlie's Bar on West 49th Street. As Al continued his amazing account of the story of that other Christmas Eve that crossed the lives of Blondie Swanson, Miss Clarabelle Cobb and her newborn son, the Dutchman, and his grip sack containing $50,000. As Al continued talking to Good Time Charlie, a faraway look came into his eyes. So you see, Good Time Charlie... It is no more than small wonder that since all this takes place a year ago this very night, me, Blondie, and the Dutchman have settled down to 100% legitimate and depth. Yeah, sure, and why not? A three-way split on almost 50 stolen G's is a cinch beginning to this straight and narrow. <laughs> you are laboring, as they say, under a misapprehension, good time, Charlie. I see now where it is only fair I tell you the rest of this story. Blondie makes the deal with Doc Kelton to get Miss Clarabelle Cobb and her brand new kid out of that barn and into a Class A hospital arrangement, the three of us are once again the Dutchman's hot rod, beating it along the streets of some pint-sized burg in Pennsylvania, thinking to leave this territory for them as once. You know, maybe age is catching up with me. I ought to feel great right now. We still got nearly 50,000 clams in that grip sack, and somehow I don't feel great at all. You did bring the grip sack back from Doc Kelton's, Blondie. Yeah, yeah, sure I did, Dutchman. The, the grip sack's in the back seat with Al. Uh, funny. It don't feel good. And it should. Perhaps a touch of rock candy and rye, uh, without the rock candy, would warm your heart, Dutchman. Oh, maybe so. Pass up the bottle. I am willing to do this, but the bottle will be of small comfort, as it is empty. Oh, well, thanks for nothing. Oh, well. Just nudge the motor and we'll blow this burg. Get back to native territory. New York ought to look pretty good. Hey, better slow down, Dutchman. The law is gaining on you. Oh, great. Never saw such a night in my life. That red light back there was no Christmas tree ornament. You should have stopped. Uh, sorry, officer. And you're in a church zone, clearly marked for 20 miles an hour. 40 is too much. Was hurrying home for Christmas, officer. Carrying toys yeah. for the kiddies in this tub, huh? I'll bet. I better have a look around. Uh-huh. Oh. oh, what's in this grip sack? Oh, why, uh, nothing, officer. As empty a grip sack as you'll ever run into. Yeah. No need to open it. It's empty. Well... Uh. You're right about that, mister. There's nothing there. Yeah. That... Huh? Easy, Dutchman. But you sure it's empty? Sure, I'm sure. Weren't you? It... Oh, yeah. Sure, sure. Sure, I was sure. I just wanted you to be sure. Ah. There ain't nothing but empties, huh? You guys empty this bottle all by yourselves? Uh, this bottle is once full of medicine, officer. I myself have been more than all the touch of the grip. I am now um, in the pink, as the saying goes. Oh, wise guys, huh? Three white guys. You know, if it weren't practically Christmas, I'd haul you in. Go on, now get out of our town. Oh, yeah, and Merry Christmas, three white guys. Uh, yeah, yeah, same to you. Uh, Dutchman, I... You know, Blondie, a while back you accused me of not telling you the whole story of that factory payroll job. Seems to me you forgot to tell me something pretty important, too. 
What is it about that grip sack being empty of nearly 50 G's that I ought to know? Well, I figured to fill you in, Dutchman. You, you see, see, look, Randy. Dutchman, it's that same little church. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know something? It's a miracle. I don't know yet what happened to that nearly 50 G's in the grip sack, but if that copper had caught us with that dough, we'd be on our way to the clink right now. An astute observation. Yeah. Well, you see, Dutchman, when I called on Doc Kelton tonight, I left all the dough with him, the whole 50 G's. I told him to give it back where it belongs. I told him enough more that the doc is sure he can spring Clara Bell's husband out of jail. So him and Clara Bell and the new kid can be together. Say this, uh, this Doc Kelton is the right guy. Oh, I'll say he is. But he even agreed to give us a head start for the Pennsylvania border before he notifies the law. This is the right guy. Yeah, and we better oblige the Doc and ourselves by making a border ahead of the cops. Hey, you know, that copper was right. Three wise guys, he called us. If we wasn't pretty wise, we'd have had all that cash on us when he pulled us over to the curb. I think it's a good idea we stay right on being three wise guys. I'm through stretching my luck. From here on in, I'm going to play it straight. And I'm still running a show, so you two wise guys are going straight with me. Okay? Okay. Agreed. Uh, wonder how far it is to the border. They got a lot of funny little birds here in Pennsylvania. What was that one we just left, Blondie? Oh, I saw a sign board back there, way. That word is known as uh, uh, Bethlehem. And so, on a night before Christmas, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, three wise guys were strangely touched by the spirit of the season. A spirit born in another Bethlehem nearly 2,000 years ago. And tonight, on the eve of another Christmas, may we hope that this same eternal spirit will someday bring to wise guys throughout the world the understanding that the future of the peoples of Earth rests in goodwill toward all men. that whistle be your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Signal Oil Company has asked me to remind you, this week it's especially important to drive at sensible speed, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations, so some avoidable accident doesn't mar the holiday season for you. Remember what I said at the beginning of the program, friends? That you'd find tonight's story unusual and heartwarming. Now, wasn't I right? I'm sure many of you recognized it as one of the late and great Damon Runyon's most famous tales. The radio adaptation was by Kathleen Height. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, John Brown, Marvin Miller, and Jack Moyle. The Whistler was transcribed and directed by George W. Allen with music by Wilbur Hatch and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. <laughs> <laughs>